All right, a carbohydrate, so it's a hydrate of carbon, is one way to think about it, it consists of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So we have three major types that I'm going to cover here today. Yeah, monosaccharide, so the word mono means one. Uh, sac saccharide comes from the word saccharum, which means sugar. Um, we have glucose, fructose, and galactose, so it means a single sugar unit. So it doesn't have to be broken down into in individual units. It's already in its simplest form. That's why they're typically referred to as simple carbs. Then you have your disaccharides, so di meaning two. Um, maltose, which is two glucose molecules. Uh, sucrose, which is a glucose and a fructose unit. And lactose, which is galactose and glucose. And then you have your polysaccharides, which most of what we consume in the human diet comes from starch. So starch is thousands and thousands of glucose chained together, uh, glucose units chained together. Um, so it means many. Poly means many. Um, there's glycogen, so anytime you eat meat, sorry, you low carbers, there's a little bit of carbon, carbs in there from glycogen. You know, just like we store it, so does the cow and the chicken and, you know, the pig and any other animal that you decide to feast on. They have a little bit of carbohydrate content in them, it just immeasurable for the most part. And cellulose, which we, the humans cannot digest because um, we lack the cellulase enzyme, which breaks down cellulose. So that's typically found in plants. All right, so all carbohydrates are converted to glucose and used for energy. So when we're training, for instance, we're breaking down, well, I said earlier, creatine first, then we start breaking down carbohydrates in the form of glucose stored in the muscle, which is referred to as glycogen. Um, you could feed one cell from another. So one, one um, cell can feed another one with glucose. So that's another way we use it. And let's not forget the brain and the neurons like to feed on glucose. So that tends to become a problem. I mean, you can use ketone bodies as well, but it's not as uh, efficient for fuel, fuel utilization. Uh, and then the liver utilizes glucose to regulate blood sugar. So the liver can constantly convert um, glucose to keep your blood sugar le level stable. So it's your main regular uh, regulator of glucose homeostasis. Uh, yeah, so the liver has a pretty almost infinite ability to continue producing glucose to keep your blood sugar level stable so you don't die. Um, that is that. So how about calories? Every gram of carbohydrate has four calories per gram. Remember this because it's not that much compared to fat or alcohol, which we'll talk about later. Um, same as protein, also has four calories per gram. And this is an important thing to know for our purposes. There is a linear relationship between carb utilization and the intensity of an activity. So the harder something gets above rest, the more you're going to rely on carbs. So that's something I was talking to Rip about earlier with these marathoners. You know, it's maybe light compared to a sprint or, you know, a squat, a heavy squat or 1RM, but they're running pretty fast. To make, they're running as fast as they can at that pace. So it's considered a vigorous activity still. It's just not an all-out effort because you can't sustain that for two hours or three hours or however fast you're running a marathon. But basically, when you're resting, you're probably burning either a 50-50 fat-to-carb ratio or mostly fat. You know, some people would argue that. Just It really depends on the person. Um, when you start exercising or doing anything intensely, you start relying more and more on carbs to the point where if it's, you know, an all-out sprint, creatine, glycogen, you know. So the higher the intensity, the more you rely on carbs. Um, so that's that. And then I mentioned glucose homeostasis earlier. So every time you consume something that's high in carbohydrates, your blood glucose levels rise. And then you release a hormone called insulin from your pancreas that brings it back down. And this kind of continues throughout the day. Um, insulin is also an anabolic hormone. So it's actually the most anabolic hormone in the human body. So it allows you to deposit um, amino acids into the muscle and facilitate protein synthesis. What people often want to talk about with insulin is that it can also lead to fat deposition because it allows you to shuttle um, fatty acids to form um, stored adipose tissue. So the funny thing about that is you have to actually consume fat for that to happen. So if there's, no, if there's not enough fat being consumed from the diet, how are you going to deposit fat, right? Um, you can convert carbohydrates and theoretically protein into fat, but that's not metabolically efficient. Now, you know, kind of go into why later when we start talking about macronutrient partitioning, but just for now, 
understand that insulin does two things. It helps you build muscle, but it also helps you store fat, depending on how you're eating and what type of training you're doing. Is everybody clear on that? So this last point, so chronic hyperinsulinemia leads to insulin resistance. So if your insulin levels are high all the time, which could happen if, let's say, you're very overweight, you have a very poor diet, you're overeating, you're constantly spiking those blood sugar levels. Every time you spike your blood sugar levels, your insulin has to rise to bring it back down. Eventually what you develop is hyperinsulinemia, where your insulin levels are just high at rest. So if your insulin levels are high at rest all the time, that means you're becoming resistant to the hormone. It's not lowering your blood sugar. Your blood sugar is staying high, your insulin is staying high. So typically when you get somebody who's insulin resistant, they're not yet diabetic. So the first thing that happens is insulin levels are high. Then later that starts to wear and tear on the pancreas and then that organ stops functioning as well. And now you start dropping insulin and sugar gets even higher. So you might get somebody who's insulin resistant has a perfectly normal blood sugar because they're pumping out so much insulin to keep it normal. Then you start to see the levels climb, 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 climb. So by the time you have a fasting glucose level of, I don't know, 120, which is almost diabetic, um, you, you may have had hyperinsulinemia for quite a long time at that point because at first it doesn't necessarily, um, it, it isn't necessarily accompanied by high blood sugar. That's something that kind of develops over time. Is that kind of clear to everybody? So your three points again, insulin helps you build muscle. It also helps with fat storage, but um, it also can maintain a normal glucose level when you're resistant to the hormone by keeping levels very high. So this is kind of what I just talked about. Um, it improves nutrient partitioning, so you're, you are more effectively able to deposit those amino acids and build muscle proteins, which theoretically, again, as I said earlier, can lead to increases in lean body mass. Um, if you're eating a high-fat diet, it could facilitate fat deposition because it also does that. So again, that really comes down to how you're eating, and we're going to talk about how to plan your diet well to you know, kind of minimize the chances of that, but in short words, it's not evil, even though everybody is, everybody is now an endocrinologist that specializes in insulin resistance. You don't even have to go to school for this. You don't have to be an MD to be an endocrinologist now. You just have to you know, tell people that insulin is going to get you fat, and it's this horrible, horrible thing. Fiber. We talked about fiber earlier. We can't digest this. It's um, part of the plant um, that can't be digested by enzymes. It has a few... Um, um, this is one of those slides I wish I just put a picture up. I'm just going to you know, talk here. So it um, has binding ability. So it helps bind fat that you eat from food and it lowers, or it helps bind cholesterol that you consume from food so you can eliminate it. Um, you can excrete it in your uh, feces. Um, it also lowers blood cholesterol because it, some fibers are gel forming. So you have different ways to classify them. You can classify them by solubility, whether they're soluble in water or not soluble in water. And that's typically what you'll see on a food label. It'll say soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. But that doesn't really paint the whole picture of how functional that fiber is. So um, a more preferable classification system would be fermentability or um, gel forming ability, because if it can form gels, it can bind to various things, including cholesterol. And that's how it lowers blood cholesterol. Um, if it's fermentable, it can feed your gut bacteria, your healthy gut bacteria, which is also associated with a reduction in cardiometabolic disease. Um, Insoluble fiber tends to be non-fermentable, but not always. Some insoluble fibers have fermentability, and then soluble fibers tend to be fermentable, but not always. Some of them are non-fermentable. That's why that solubility classification isn't a very good one, but it's been kind of used for decades and decades and decades, and that's what you're typically going to see on a food label. But um, as a consumer, you really, if, you eat, if you eat foods that are high in fiber, you're going to get both. You typically don't just get one versus the other, although some foods have a higher ratio of soluble to insoluble and vice versa. Um, but uh, yeah, the main benefit to it is it increases fecal bulk, so it's good for gastrointestinal health, um, and it lowers blood cholesterol. So because it has binding ability, this goes back to a question that uh, Brent asked earlier about protein. It can bind to some of those enzymes that help break down proteins, which is how it inhibits um, protein absorption. So if you eat something that's very, very high in fiber, Let's say you eat 20 grams of protein and 50 grams of fiber in a meal, you might not absorb as much of that protein. I mean, these are random numbers. So there's no real way to you know, kind of measure that, but that's just kind of an extreme example there. Um, especially those gel-forming soluble fibers, they tend to have more of a binding ability. So 
they'll bind cholesterol, but then they can also bind other things like micronutrients and protein. Does that make sense to everybody? It's kind of like a sponge, you want to kind of think of it as. Whereas the uh, insoluble non-fermentable uh, just forms, a, forms fecal bulk, and that's kind of what makes you, you know, go to the bathroom nice and happy, you know. So you have to make sure that when you're eating this stuff, you're also drinking a lot of water because it can also have the opposite effect. If you're not drinking a lot of water and you're pounding a lot of fiber, now you're not going to the bathroom as much, and that's not pleasant. So I'll always remember you want to keep a good water intake, and that's the same with protein. Protein isn't digested quite as well if you're not staying very hydrated. So eat your fiber. So sugar alcohols. Um, it is not sugar plus a bottle of vodka. It does not equal sugar alcohols. It equals a sugary, uh, what would that equal? I guess if, you, if that sugar is coming in the form of a juice beverage, I guess you have a mixed drink. Or you can call it a cocktail, but it's not a sugar alcohol. Um, you'll typically see these in sugar-free gum or sugar-free candies. Things are advertised as sugar-free. Tend to be high in sugar alcohols as well as artificial sweeteners. Um, and then some examples of them are xylitol, malitol, mannitol. If you see that OL at the end, it's an alcohol, and that's you know a chemistry thing there. They can, they are known to cause gastrointestinal distress, as are artificial sweeteners. And there is some recent data that suggests that it could be have a negative impact on your gut bacteria. So that's one of the things that I will say about artificial sweeteners that could be a potential negative, but it's not going to give you cancer in two days. That part is not true. Um, and there they are. So our most common ones are aspartame, saturin, sucralose, and stevia. I have a sulfime, I always say this one wrong, a sulfime K that's uh, typically found in foods that are already processed. It's usually not found in like a sweetener packet, but these are your most common artificial sweeteners. And the thing to know about these is that they are a lot sweeter than sugar. And people don't necessarily understand this. Like Splenda, for instance, is 9,000 times sweeter than sugar, but you're not going to have as much Splenda as you would sugar. There's usually a lot of filler in these products because if you took a tablespoon of sugar and a tablespoon of the actual artificial sweetener, it would be very, very, very intense. So a random fact there is aspartame has four calories per gram. The thing is you don't consume a gram of aspartame in a packet of sweet and low, so they don't list that, but it actually does contain calories even though it's an artificial sweetener. Um, they're not going to, you know, again, cause cancer or kill you or not these evil things. And some of us tolerate them better than others. I can drink diet soda all day and I'm fine, but somebody else might get diarrhea. But the main thing that has been um, kind of uncovered recently is that it can have a negative impact on your gut bacteria. So, you know, you don't want to consume a lot of these for that reason, but, you know, sometimes it helps. You know, if you're dieting, you need to curb cravings, you know, and you're used to eating a very sweet diet, you can go that direction. Generally, it comes back to palate, right? If you're used to eating a lot of sweet stuff, you're going to want a lot of sweet stuff, and stopping cold turkey is not necessarily going to be easy, so there has to be some sort of transition there. But ideally, you know, I don't say that, like, sugar's bad or sugar alcohols or um, artificial sweeteners or salt or any of these things are bad in and of themselves, but a high concentration of them in your diet um, can change the way your palate, you know, um, responds to foods. And you start to kind of require and crave more extreme flavors. So that's the real, really the answer there is, you know, to, over time you want to think about kind of limiting um, your exposure to extreme flavors because you just want more of them, you know. So if, you eat, if you're like a salty person, right, and you eat a lot of fat in your diet, it's kind of hard to get off that. If you eat a lot of sweet stuff that's like very, very concentrated in sweets like cakes, donuts, uh, things like that, et cetera, then you're just going to want that all the time. So... <laughs> You know, it's just kind of something to keep in mind. We get a lot of questions about this, so I thought I'd kind of hit on that. So, how much do you need? Well, maybe not as much as Musser. Looking as happy as ever. Um, again, so as intensity increases above rest, you require more carbohydrates in relation to the other macronutrients because you cannot effectively use fat at a high-intensity activity. Protein's not a very good energy source as it is. It tend tends to be used to create proteins, and we're also not going to eat enough of it to start using it for energy. So carbs are the easiest one to get if you are a physically active person who's doing anything remotely hard. Um, and again, high intensity activity, you're always going to use creatine first, but then you're going to start to break down glycogen the longer you're 
you know, performing a workout. So maybe the first set of squats, you might not even touch it. Then by the second set, you break down a little bit more and you break down a little bit more and you break down a little bit more. By the end of your whole workout, you've done a full body workout. You've lost some of your glycogen there. So um, you definitely want to make sure you're eating enough carbs to replenish that. But more importantly, when you're lifting heavy, there's a lot of uh, central nervous system activity as we kind of learned in the previous lecture. And your nerves rely on glucose, so does your brain. So, you know, you have to eat it for that reason. And in general, a good approximation is roughly about 130 carbs just go to brain function. Right there's the number I've seen thrown around. And I'm sure there's, what this with, as with any number, anytime you hear a number like you need this much to do X, you got to remember there's always a range there. So that number may not be the same for you. But the general approximation is that your brain requires about 130 grams of carbohydrate per day to function and your nerves like to soak the stuff up. So remember to eat your carbs if you're gonna be training. If you're gonna be do anything remotely hard, you have to eat carbs.